When I was nine years old, my life changed a lot. It was Thanksgiving weekend, 1997, and my mom had to travel for a business trip. So a couple of my siblings and I thought that we would say our goodbyes to her off at the airport. And so we dropped her off, but on the way home, my dad lost control of the car. I sustained a few accidents from the injury. I broke a couple bones in my leg, which would leave me in a wheelchair for a few months. And I suffered a nerve injury to my right arm, the brachial plexus, which is still with me to this day. And on top of all of that, not everyone made it out of the car accident alive. My dad didn't make it. Due to some of the cultural stigma around the fact that my mom was now a widow and the fact that I was now disabled, I didn't really get the help that I needed. And I lived in that place of loss and grief for a really long time. I was a victim of my circumstance. A lot's happened since then. I relearned how to write with my left hand, and I went back to school after the accident. I graduated from Georgetown. I moved to New York City, and I worked on Wall Street. And then I worked for P. Diddy. And then I moved again, this time to San Francisco. And I started my own company based on an idea, based on an idea that I had when I was at Georgetown to build a movement around disability pride. And just like my own personal journey, building diversability has been quite the journey as well. I first came up with the idea for diversability as a senior at Georgetown. It was resident assistant training, and I was wondering why there weren't more spaces for us to share our lived experiences, those of us who had disabilities, and to bring our non-disabled peers into the conversation as well. Dr. Vivian Ming, She's a neurologist, she's a neuroscientist. She says that one of the best ways to tackle bias is through real life continuous experiences with people who challenge your stereotypes. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to challenge perceptions around disability. And so I applied for and won a Reimagine Georgetown grant and the money helped us turn this idea into a reality. But more than that, it was this vote of confidence in this idea and in me and that was something I had never had before. I didn't really think of doing anything with it after I had graduated from Georgetown. But after a couple of years, I started getting messages from people I had never met before, asking me how they could get involved. And I realized that maybe these spaces were still needed for those of us who weren't in school anymore. And since then, our community has grown. Friendships, connections, and partnerships have been made. We've been challenging perceptions and attitudes around disability, and we've had the opportunity to share our work on stages I could have never dreamed of. And along the way, I've been called a lot of things. A role model, a leader, a trailblazer, and a pioneer. So those are some pretty heavy words, so I was like, you know what? Let me, let me look into this a little bit more. So I looked up one of these words, pioneer, and the definition is one who goes before to prepare or open up the way for others to follow. And it feels a little weird for me to see this definition and to have that associated with me. Because the thing is, what I'm doing isn't really that groundbreaking at all. I'm facilitating conversations about a topic that we're all a little bit uncomfortable with. And there have been a lot of others in the disability community who have come before me who have paved the way for me to do the work that I do. But I have a feeling that the reason why you're here today, the reason why you showed up or are watching this, is because you aspire to be or already are one of these things. And I don't blame you. We get a lot of messaging to be this way. Don't wait for leaders. Become them. Of course, we have to bring Oprah into it. Dare to be different, be a pioneer, be a leader. And my personal favorite, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? But to be honest, I feel like this messaging is a little bit misleading because it only shows the highlights, that point when you've overcome something or you've become triumphant or you've won. But there's so much happening behind the, behind the scenes backstage that you don't even really get to see. And so one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to share some of the lessons that I've learned along the way, some of this backstage stuff. First, we are all a work in progress. 
I talk a lot about the power of our stories and recognizing the validity of our experiences. The beautiful thing about our stories is that they continue to grow and evolve. I've come a long way since that nine-year-old girl, but I still have a long way to go. And I've accomplished some things, but the work doesn't stop there. The work doesn't stop with that one piece of press or that one invitation to give a TED Talk or that one win. For me, there's a real mental health component to the childhood trauma that I went through and having a physical disability that people don't really talk about. Sometimes the social stigma around disability is harder to deal with than the disability itself. And even more than two, two decades after the car accident, I still find myself triggered by things, whether it's people who see my splint and tell me that they hope I get well soon, or, or the times when I don't get invited to something and I'm reminded of all of the times I felt excluded when I was growing up. And professionally, I've made mistakes, I've been called out, there have been sleepless nights, and I can get easily discouraged that I'm not making the impact that I want. But the truth is, I actually think that we spend most of our time in these in-between moments. And it's in these moments that I remind myself that number one, I'm not alone, and number two, I'm human and I'm still learning. So be patient with yourself and be kind because it's a long road that has a lot of bumps and needs a lot of rest stops along the way. Second, there will be critics. When I first came up with the idea for diversibility, I was so excited, but I wanted to get some weigh in that this was actually a good idea. So I emailed a couple of my peers who, who had disclosed disabilities telling them a little bit about what I was looking to build. And I never got a response. That was feedback in itself. Then I got connected to someone who I knew was passionate about disability studies, and I told her my idea, and she told me that the world wasn't ready. The world wasn't ready to acknowledge more empowering narratives around disability. There was still so much stigma to overcome. And finally, in sheer excitement, I shared this idea with one of my classmates, and he asked me why I thought anyone would care about this. But I'm a little stubborn, so I still went ahead with it. I felt this urge that something needed to be done now. And what I realized was that, people that those people that I was trying to talk to, those weren't the right people. When you decide to be a leader, you're making a statement about what you believe in. You're taking a stance on something. And there will be people who don't agree with you, there will be people who don't like change, and there will be people who can't celebrate your successes with you. So learn to go past them. You are challenging the status quo, and if you are confident and consistent in what you believe, that's enough. Fill that space, and the rest will follow. Third, it will be lonely. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to attend a high-profile international gathering, which brought together world leaders, including our nation's president, corporate executives, and some of the brightest minds in civil society and academia, including our university's president. I was invited to help represent the voice of youth, and I was going to be speaking on diversity and disability and design and social media. And I felt really honored and privileged to have the opportunity to attend. Prior to our arrival, a couple of the demographics of this event were shared. Among the 3,000 attendees, 21% were women, and the average age would, was in the 50s. They didn't provide any stats on people of color or disability, but I'm pretty sure those numbers were low too. And so as a young disabled woman of color, I kind of knew what I would be up against. But the reality of being there was so hard. I was using my voice to challenge the status quo, whether it was asking why a side event had 11 speakers, all of whom were male, to questioning why accessibility information couldn't be publicly listed on all of the venues, to being told that my expectations around inclusive design for disability were unrealistic and too high. I was fighting this uphill battle. I didn't see anyone else who looked like me, and I felt this responsibility to represent all the underrepresented aspects of my identity. And there's a real danger in a single narrative, and the only thing I could do was represent my personal experience. 
And whether I wanted to be or not, I was the teachable moment across all of these identities. I remember catching up with Professor Libby Rifkin when I came back, and she said something that really resonated with me. She said, there were no mirrors. I would look around and I couldn't see any reflections of myself, but I knew that I needed to be there, and I needed to be there to represent my community of those who couldn't and may never get the chance to be there. So sometimes being a pioneer means that you're the first and oftentimes the only. But the truth is we can really only be an only for so long before we start to get a little bit bruised and those bruises start to become deeper wounds. But stay the course, stay focused, and in the meantime, bring others along with you. You can't be everywhere, but you're exactly where you need to be. And finally, we are all pioneers. So I wanna go back to one of my first professional experiences. I was an investment banker, and you can replace it with any other profession in case that's not as cool as it is when it was back in the day. Um, but for me, that internship was just an internship. I was in the business school here, I'd studied finance, and getting that internship in, in investment banking was kind of like my win. And when I came back from that internship, something really interesting happened. I started having all of these informational interviews and calls with women, with people of color, with disabled students, all curious what it was like to work in finance. And what I realized was because I was there, I was almost like a role model for them, showing them that they could pursue careers in these fields if they wanted to. And so again, for me, even though I thought that this internship was just an internship, I represented so much more to all of the communities that I represent. And so whether you want to be or not, someone is watching you. And you actually, don't, it could be across any of the identities or communities that you represent. It could be the fact that you're a Georgetown student, it could be someone who is in your friends or family circle, or it could even be someone who follows you on social media. So the important thing here is to remember that someone's always watching, but be generous with your time because you never know how much of an impact you can actually make on someone. And so after reflecting on all of these lessons, I'm really inspired by a tweet that I saw from Senator Kamala Harris. And paraphrase, she says, whenever you find yourself in a room where there aren't a lot of people who look like you, be it a classroom or a boardroom or a courtroom, remember that you have an entire community in that room with you, all of us cheering you on. I may be standing up here by myself, but I know that I'm not alone. And in spite of all of these learnings, I'm still pushing forward. Why? Because it's the only way I know how. And my hope is, after hearing all of this, I literally won't be standing up here by myself. You will join me. How? Start by looking within. And so I'll come back to this whole idea of mirrors with, with another quote. When you are looking in the mirror, you are looking at the problem. But remember, you are also looking at the solution. And so when I look back at my own experiences, a lot of the things that I've done have, because, have been because I wanted to solve something for myself. And it just so happened that it had an impact on other people as well. And so for you, start by focusing within. You'd be surprised at how much of an impact you can make on others. So be the pioneer for yourself. <laughs>